How's it going? All right. You know, um, phrenology, have you studied phrenology or did you just get onto that? How did you get onto that? So my PhD was partly in history of science and neuroscience and psychiatry were the, the branches of science that I was, that I was mainly focused on. So I looked into it a little bit during that time. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that I've studied in great deal. Catherine, first of all, can you tell us the, how would you describe yourself? You know, what is your, your field and how do you speak about the work that you do? Because we do have to introduce you. Okay, so I, I started off as a machine learning researcher, um, but only did that for a very brief time because 20 years ago that was not a marketable skill, which might seem surprising now because it's sort of the most marketable skill these days. So I, I ended up um, becoming a philosopher of science instead. And now I've kind of combined the two and, and I'm working on AI ethics. So philosophy of artificial intelligence is what I'm working on these days. And I'm an assistant professor at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, in Canada. So, you know, when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence, a lot of people think that that's one thing. Like it's just not, you know, thousands and thousands of different algorithms. So what do you think we're actually talking about? You know, not the the Marvin Minsky aspiration of artificial intelligence, but when we talk about it now, what are we really talking about? Yeah, it's sort of hard to put your finger on it because it's changed its meaning so many times recently. Right now, it seems to be just about synonymous with just technology in general. And part of the reason for that is that just about every device that we have that tech companies are producing has some kind of machine learning algorithm built into it. So uh, like text completion on when you're writing text messages, search algorithms when you're using Google, um, people's fridges now have AI in them sometimes. Mine doesn't, I have a cheap fridge. <laughs> um, but yeah, just about all the devices around it are, are increasingly getting algorithms built into them. And also machine learning used to be just sort of a small branch of artificial intelligence, but now it's kind of taken over and at least in the, the popular imagination seems to be synonymous with AI. You know, but when we, when, when you think of the word fairness related to AI, you know, what do you think? Yeah, I, I have to pause because my first reaction is that it's, it's kind of bullshit, but that wouldn't be entirely fair. We well, know what fair means. Wait, wait, um, wait, wait, no, no, I have a question. When you say it's, you mean there is no fairness or it's bullshit so, expression doesn't work or I'm curious what I want to understand. A couple of reasons. Yeah. So there's a sort of subfield of machine learning that is working on fairness algorithms. And I'm not very optimistic that that's going to be a very useful way of trying to solve problems of, of bias that algorithms are causing. Um, it, it seems more like a, a band-aid solution and uh, you know, using the tool that is the problem to try to solve the problem that the tool caused and algorithmic approaches to solving the problems that algorithms are causing just seems a little fishy. But another issue is that it's hard to define fairness in a way that encompasses everything that we think fairness means and some of those meanings of fairness that seem like valid meanings of fairness contradict each other. So there's, there's been a few cases recently where people have, have like proven that different notions of fairness, each of which seem reasonable, can't both be maximized at the same time. So you can't have both kinds of fairness at the same time. Wow. And one, one of the cases where that was explored was um, a ProPublica article about the, a system called Compass that is used in, in some I think most of the U.S. cases, um, judges use it to decide on on bail cases and, and sentencing cases to to figure out which of the the people coming in front of their their bench have a high or a low likelihood of recommitting offenses. And it is it gives sort of different kinds of biased results for for black and white defendants. Its errors go in different directions for. For the two groups so if you're 
a black defendant and you, it turns out, we don't know this yet, but you're going to turn out not to reoffend. It's, it's more suspicious that you're going to compared to white defendants who aren't going to reoffend and, and the opposite for a white defendant who is, is going to reoffend. It's, it, it's more likely to think that you're not going to. So, but, but, but to, to, to try to solve that, that people tried to solve like, well, how should we fix it? What should the, you know, all those sort of levers, what positions should they have? You know, how many people should we be suspicious of? How many people should we be trusting of? And there isn't any way of making all of the numbers line up in a way that's fair to everybody with all of the different definitions of fairness in mind. So you can. But how do yeah. we get here? Well, sorry, Jesse, but I would just, I don't think everyone understands that this is you know, that AI is being used in this way, right? So it's not as widely known as, as you know, that, that a little explanation would, would help, I think, of what's been happening. Sure, yeah. So AI has moved into a lot of cases where people are making decisions about things involving society and social issues and, and even sort of personality issues. So it's it's being used for things not only like what shows up on your feed if you're on a, a social media platform, what kind of ads you're going to be served, um, but also things like sentencing and decisions in courts, um, decisions of who to hire and who not to hire in big companies are being being made using AI, um, grading people's non-existent exams in the in the UK to decide who should get to into universities and who shouldn't all kinds of cases that have like really kind of big real world world impacts and in medicine too so um, which people should get to the front of the line and in triage is another place where where algorithms are being used and that you know isn't always done in ways that are fair whatever fair means um, you know at its core Aren't some of these issues, well, first of all, when I look at a group of people and I say, well, they have sloped faces, that means they're a criminal, right? Isn't, isn't that just a very base way of looking at a bias before it's anything else? It's just like, because how could we know that? Doesn't this as an idea, how we're thinking about AI bump up against how we think about people? And ultimately, that's the flaw, yeah. is that it's, we're the flaw? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely the flaw. That's right. Um, like, where, where we're putting our sort of muddy fingers on it is, is kind of the complicated part. And I think we're putting our, our muddy fingers on it in a bunch of different places. And you need to be aware of all of those different ways that we're, we're making it go wrong. So one case that gets a lot of attention is that data sets are biased. So um, one pretty clear example of that was in, in hiring algorithms, where if you have a name that sounds black, then the hiring algorithm um, gives you a lower score than if you have a name that sounds white. And if you have the word women's in your, your resume anywhere, then it gives you a lower score. So if you went to a women's college or you know, were captain of the women's volleyball team or something like that, that gives you a lower score. And that's because those algorithms were based on the hiring decisions of HR people in the past. And those HR people in the past were biased in various ways that you know, were not surprising. And it, it picked up on, okay, well, we're supposed to do the job of these HR people. We're supposed to automate it. I'm, I'm sort of personifying the, the AI right now. Um, what decisions did they make? What kind of criteria should we look for and who they think is a, a, a hireable person? And while they seem to not like people with black sounding names, they seem not to like people who you know, advertise that they're women. And so we'll reproduce those things in, in the algorithms. And so that's a case where using historical data, it has a bunch of bias in it that we don't want to reproduce. So we need to somehow fix the data set. And how to do that is is kind of complicated, and that's one of the jobs that that fairness work is is trying to solve. And it's not totally clear that you can always fix the data set. Um, like one example of that, I came across recently, right? So you, it it seems like a a pretty nutty claim to say that alphabetical order is racist, um, but Recently with um, 
putting putting kids into online schools in in Toronto the way that they decided which kids were going to go in which class for the online schools they they used alphabetical order and if you think about it for even like a few seconds you realize that all of the people named Naguya and are going to be in the same class and if you think a little bit longer you're going to realize that the Z class is going to be you know 99% Chinese students mm -hmm. and they also had a shortage of teachers and so the classes at the end of the alphabet had to wait you know a week or a week and a half longer to get assigned to classes and we're just sort of sitting around with no schooling until those teachers were were hired and put into place so the the people who were sort of disadvantaged in this case the most were the people at the end of the alphabet and there's like a pretty significant skew in like which races have their last names at the end of the alphabet if you look at u.s census data um so like, and were those kids building plush cities i have no idea what they're doing no yeah, my they kids are going to cities out of plush plush why do you ask? <laughs> Didn't you build the whole city out of plush toys and things? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no? I don't know. I don't know if that's what they're doing. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay, um, wanna, wait, <laughs> wait, Jesse, the, I just, it, I know you, it's really, I mean, now I know why you're, you're upset. <laughs> I mean, it's, how do we, what do we do about that? I mean, if we're the ones, we're, as Jesse said, we're the flaw, right, in the algorithm, we're the problem. But but I think I think it's deeper than that. You know, if um, if I was doing virtual reality and I was looking at myself as a, a small girl or as a an old person, you know, doesn't that start to fundamentally make me think differently about the world that I'm looking at? And doesn't that even betray the algorithm deeper? Because we are, we're all bringing our own bias to what the algorithms are, whether we want to bring them or not, and we have no way to get away from ourselves to look at them, do we? Yeah, I think that's the other major source of these problems is that it is really hard to look at the world from a different point of view than your own or one that you're, you're at least close to. And since AI is not a very diverse field, there's a certain kind of person who works in that field. It's a very narrow viewpoint. And it's, it is pretty racially diverse, like computer science in general is pretty racially diverse in a way. It's, it's not very black, but it has a lot of brown people and Asian people, and it's, but it's not very diverse in terms of social class. It's not, very, it's not at all diverse in terms of um, what kind of university you graduated from. There's sort of like three universities that you had to go to basically to be in the, the sort of top echelon of AI people. And it's you know not very globally diverse. It's sort of like a few pockets. It's not very um, diverse in terms of disability. Um, so there's lots of ways that it's not diverse, even though it's not um, super white. But but even yeah, within that, with even within that diversity, you it's like wouldn't these algorithms? Not that it would solve the problem, but wouldn't we be a step closer to you know? Uh, a priest, a community organizer, a rabbi, a, a you know, LGBTQ, you know, like like just if we had a board of diverse people together to think about, you know, what would be the way that the algorithms are weighted, wouldn't that be um, a step in the right direction, even if it's not totally in, in the right direction? Because it seems sort of arbitrary that the people, you know, at Facebook, you know, you have an engineer being in charge of the algorithm, but it's like that hasn't really, I, I'm not sure that it's intentionally trying to do devastating things, but, but you don't have a representation of society or the society that we want to build thinking about what it is, you know? Yeah, one case like that, that, that hit me early on when I was in grad school, when I was working in, in a computer science department was the kind of algorithm that's used these days for all of the sort of recommendations we get for media. So things like Netflix and Amazon and um, that tell us, you know, what you might want to watch next or what you might want to read or buy next. And that all, almost all of those use an algorithm called collaborative filtering. That's basically, well, this other person liked the same thing as you. So let's give you all their other recommendations. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like, you know, I'll have what she, what she's having. And it's, 
it depends really fundamentally on there being other people who are like you in in this the system and it's like an explicit assumption of it that nobody is unique and maybe it seems that way from the the point of view of the people who built it but I'm not sure that that's true. Maybe there are people who are unique. And when I first looked at this kind of algorithm, and I was a bit of a sort of outlier kind of person in a computer science department in various ways, um, it immediately struck me that, uh, well, like, I don't think I'm going to get good recommendations from this because I don't at, at all trust that there are other people out there who have the same you know, kind of taste that I have. And one of the things that I'm working on now is is trying to show that you know, with with numbers that to characterize like what are the what's the uniqueness of a person in one of these systems and do the more unique people get worse recommendations um, and that could be solved by you would think that you, that could be solved by having a more diverse group of people or having sort of a, a diversity board and that's it's both a popular idea and a really unpopular idea mm-hmm. and one of the reasons why it's unpopular and like one of the good reasons I think why it's unpopular is that it's not clear who should sit on that board, mm-hmm. which bases do you need to cover, mm-hmm. um, who are the relevant people whose point of views you need to have, and it's, you know, it's not clear how you can cover every possible point of view with, you know, do you need a five-person board, do you need a 15-person board, do you need to cover every language group on the, the, on the continent? It's not really sh- clear like, where you should stop, and, and like, who are the people who are most representative of diversity and who aren't? Well, I mean, I guess you could look at um, China and we could see a lot of people who shouldn't be represented on the board who are on the board. You know, like there they've tried to create a perfect system. We don't have a perfect system, but we have to do something to try and improve it because it's not working for society at the moment. Yeah, I think these kind of boards, they, if they have the power to actually influence what's happening in a company, they can be a good step, but I don't think they're the the entirety of the answer to, to this kind of problem. Um, you know, the, the um, training of people in, in the field also has to. How do we weight the decision making process? Um, in uh, data statistics, I can have something that gives me better, uh, you know, treatment for diabetes. It could tell me what drug to take, but it doesn't necessarily prioritize the cure. So how do I know, how, how do we improve, you know, I mean, it's like, um, I'm struck by, you know, when we think about, um, uh, you know, we'll have a total debate about nuclear weapons, but we'll have no discussion about synthetic biology, even though synthetic biology could release a bug that eats too too many CO2 emissions and the whole earth could cool and we could all die, right? There's no public debate about it, right? But it strikes me that a lot of these issues with AI, it's just AI is going to make stuff better, but, but it it isn't necessarily gonna make stuff better because if we can't decide what it prioritizes and give it instructions, non-conflicting instructions, then then we're not gonna have better stuff. We're gonna make life harder for people. Like, how do you think about that? Yeah, and the, the kind of common example for, for that problem is um, a paperclip maximizing algorithm that is supposed to you know, help a paperclip this is somebody's thought experiment that you have a, a paperclip factory and you you want your your robot to to help you with you know maximize your sales and so it it's this paperclip manufacturing max, maximizing thing and then if you follow it along well if if it's really going to do its job well it's going to sort of take over all the resources on the earth and then it's going to start colonizing other planets and maybe this wasn't really what we should have had as the goal in the first place um, but there's there's sort of real world examples that are a little bit like that. So um, allegedly YouTube's algorithm for what to show people next when it's doing autoplay um, is is maximized for engagement. So what's going to make you click on the next video? What's going to make you watch for longer? And it turns out that when you maximize for that, the the best way of doing that with YouTube videos is to show more and more extreme content and so it puts people down sort of rabbit holes of conspiracy theories and it it's i think demonstrably radicalized youth in various ways that like probably wasn't the goal or wasn't a goal that most people would agree with as a good goal and and that's that's one of the 
maybe more vivid cases, but there's, that's a problem that exists all over the place. Even, even if you're maximizing for something like accuracy of whatever you're, you're trying to classify. So um, in a medical context, if you want to maximize accuracy of, of you know, figuring out which, which cells are cancerous and which aren't or something like that, that might not be the right thing to maximize for, even though it seems like it should be because maximizing for accuracy might do something like say nobody has cancer because that kind of cancer is really rare. That would be a way of maximizing accuracy, but it's not actually what you want. You want to detect all the cases that are there. Or it might, um, you know, if there are sort of two kinds of people in your population that have where their cancer cells look different and one of those groups is much bigger than the other, you might just focus on detecting it for the bigger group and completely ignoring the, the smaller group. And that would still be a way of maximizing accuracy, but maybe you don't want to, you know, not detect cancer in this other group, even if it's a smaller group. Um, how would we, you know, AI is here to stay. It's not like we're going to be going backwards anytime soon. So how do we, you know, any technology can be deployed for, um, you know, the empowerment of, you know, humankind or for, you know, it can be used for negative applications. How do we as a society try to guide AI forward? You know, it, it's, it's whatever AI is, it's starting to inundate every facet of our lives, you know, from the refrigerator to, you know, the way we're going to go in the hospital, which room we're going to get. How do we, how do we try and make it better? And how do we educate people to think about this as a, as an important issue? Yeah, I think one main thing is that regulation has to be a part of this. So companies right now can put hidden cameras in thermostats and hidden microphones and things and, that you don't know are there and do whatever they want with the data that they gather. And those, there's, there's a bunch of things like that that shouldn't be legal. And the kinds of terms of terms of use conditions that the companies are are allowed to make, where they're basically allowed to sell any data that you make available to them, um, maybe that shouldn't be, you know, allowed to be binding legally with just a, a click of "I agree" without you know looking into it. So those are things that can be done in, in terms of regulation, and and I think should be done. Um, yeah, another thing that. I think is at least worth exploring is that in AI, you don't need to get ethics approval for the research that you're doing usually in, in sort of university and, and hospital contexts, unless you're partnering with, with someone who's doing health work or something like that. But in lots of other fields in psychology, in you know, any other field where you're using data about human beings or, or animals, you need to get ethics approval. And because a lot of the data that people in, in AI use, they're not getting it directly from people, they're sort of scraping it from websites. They don't officially, according to the rules, have to get ethics approval, even though there are you know, human subjects down the line, sort of one step away. And that's another thing that I think should be looked into, that if you're using data about people, even if you're not gathering it from the people directly, maybe you should be following the same rules that people who are gathering data directly from people have to follow in how terms of getting your, your studies approved. How would you, I mean, it's kind of depressing to listen to this conversation because it feels that it's so far gone, right? I mean, and, and it continues to repeat itself. So how would we go about thinking about something like that to sort of getting- Or even educating policymakers about something yeah, they I, clearly yeah. want. So the second one, I think, in some places would be fairly simple because a lot of the research money that that university researchers use comes from um, you know centralized funding agencies and if those funding agencies make a rule about how you have to do your research you have to follow the rule or you're not going to get the money and you can't do research so um, in Canada the, the tri council if they you know made a, a change in in their rulings like that that could effectively um, make that officially the way that people have to do it and the, the NHS and, and places like that in the US would could do something similar. So I think that one's implementable. There's probably a lot of, of discussion that has to go to how exactly to, to go about that before. I mean, there must be, I mean, remember a while ago, wasn't, uh, I think Elon Musk was worried about this. I mean, there have been sort of well-known 
people maybe you're, maybe it's not true, but it, I would think that there would be kind of like you said this sort of global society of of, of, of people working on AI with, with ethics that, you know, that have these concerns. And also, where did all this start? I mean, what was the first university? Who was the first? Was it Marvin Minsky? Who was the first, you know, who were the first couple of scientists that really created the field? And where's the culpability there? Yeah, I mean, there's, you hear stories about Marvin Minsky that are pretty shady. Um, and I, you know, I don't have firsthand information about any of that, so I probably shouldn't be the person to tell those stories. But it, it seems like there's, there's been since the beginning of of the the formation of the field, at least the the MIT sort of strain of the field, um, yeah, like built in misogyny, built in white supremacy, um, built in lots of ugly things. Yeah, so, and that doesn't mean that it has to stay that way. Um, we can change the culture of the field, but to change the culture of the field, probably we should consult the kind of people who know how to change cultures. So sociologists, anthropologists, we should be listening to people like that about what to do about it rather than, you know, appointing a few people to a diversity panel. And those, those voices aren't really being listened to. And people in those fields have been talking about this problem for, for decades already and have been largely ignored. And there's, there's also sort of a, a lot of people in, in AI have the view that anyone in the sort of softer fields or the, the social sciences or humanities isn't as smart as they are. And so they don't have to be listened to. We can solve all of our problems with our you know, big brains ourselves. One thing that I just kind of a little funny thing that I looked into was I noticed that announcements for events about AI often have wording like the most brilliant minds in the world and the best minds in the world and the smartest people in the world. And it's kind of common to have that kind of language advertising AI events. But it's that's not a thing that other fields say about themselves. It would be kind of embarrassing if you know, philosophers that are advertised their event as like the most brilliant philosophers in the world. Like people would think that that was kind of gauche. Yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, that is really interesting. And that is, that is really interesting. So the, the bravado and, and I mean, when you think about it, were you always interested in this, like as a, as a young woman? I mean, were you, first of all, did you read or were you interested in science fiction? Were you interested in, in AI from a perspective of what, just the intriguing part, or did you get into this from the sort of philosophical, ethical, injustice, you know, seeming to see some injustices that were happening and, and trying to get into it from that perspective? It was, it was a little bit of each in sort of different ways. So I, yeah, I guess I was always interested in science and what got me into AI was wanting to understand like the mind and the brain and how people think and what intelligence is. So that was sort of the way in. And I've, I've always, I've kind of kept going back to science fiction at, at various points and wanted to like it, but then found that either like the writing was so terrible that I couldn't keep up with it or that like it's so sort of like rapey that I can't keep reading the story. But I've, recently sort of branched out a little and, and started reading different kinds of authors and starting to like science fiction more. So I'm, I'm actually planning a course where all the texts are going to be science fiction texts and, 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 and videos and so on, but it's going to be a philosophy course. So teaching sort of philosophy through science fiction. So I'm kind of looking forward to I, that. I want to sign up for that. Are you going to do that virtually or is that, is that an online? Uh, well, who knows? <laughs> It'll probably cool. start next year. Who will be the main uh, the main philosophers you'll study? No philosophers. We're not going to read any philosophers. None at all. But, but but, tell us what science fiction. We don't want anyone to take your curriculum. It's a great idea. It's Catherine's IP. It's her story. But I think that's so fascinating. You're going to do it through science fiction and did you say and film or video content as well? Yeah, and I'm hoping that that things like video games and and so Janelle Monae's um, what's it called? something computer, um, recent sort of video, that's that's maybe going to be one of the things um, that would be better for the podcast if I could actually say the name of the thing. Um. You know, 
it's like, do you think that when people play video games and they put themselves in the game, that that's going to change our society? in some way i mean you know we can't leave our houses now because of covid so in some ways we're we're reaching you know we we're it's a it's a shallow simulation but a simulation nonetheless you know what i mean this was sort of my dream like mid to, to late 90s they so had i had these sort of big kind of cyberpunk fantasies mm -hmm. where you know we wouldn't have to have our, our bodies anymore we could just you know live in in something like the matrix but without the deception part of it and yeah i i don't really have that dream anymore <laughs> but yeah so, and, and i mean we i think a lot of people used to have these these ideas about things like smart homes and smart cities where everything would be so convenient and computers could actually do the things that we want them to do instead of you know trying to sell us stuff and trick us all the time and we probably could have that like we have the technology to do that. It's just that there are these other interests that are, you know, making all of the tech companies build things that we don't want instead of building things that we do want. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you, you know, when you look at AI and you look out over the future, you know, how do you see the future of education, of transportation, of, you know, any other various different kinds of things? Because I think that some version of AI is going to be just keep growing stronger in our lives every day. So. Do you see it just touching everything? Well, yeah, that seems kind of inevitable. Um, how it's going to play out, I think, is totally unknown, and, and there's a lot of room to, to push it in different directions still. For, for the transportation piece, my, my optimistic view is that once self-driving cars are sort of on the road in, in enough numbers, it will become obvious that they should sometimes sort of like join together if they're all going down the same highway and then they mm -hmm. should sort of, you know, peel off when it's time for your, your exit. And it will essentially like be a reinvention of the train only where you have like a, a personal compartment that you can go in and you can mm -hmm. kind of attach and detach at will. Mm -hmm. And that I think would be an okay solution to a lot of transportation issues, but whether it will actually go in that direction, who knows? Yeah, I want to go back to the fairness thing for a minute. Um, in a in a way that you would like to see how could what could be um, a, 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 and I'm not going to use the word fairness, but a more equal, I guess, or what would be something positive where opportunity abounds or you know inclusion or whatever that is. How could that? Could you just give us an example to leave us with of of what what that could look like in your optimistic mind yeah i mean one thing that i think would do a lot more good than than diversity panels would be changing the the way that we go about making products so that the communities that they're going to affect are involved in the design from the beginning so if it becomes normal to have you know something like focus groups right at the beginning stage where you're bringing in all of the you know, a bunch of different people who might be users or who might be affected by it even if they're not direct users so so if it's a, a medical thing then you want to bring in not just doctors but you want to bring in patients and patient advocates and family members of patients as well and people who you know don't have access to medical care and if you bring in sort of more people in the the design stages from the beginning that's i think a more positive way forward that is music to our ears, you know. Catherine, I don't know if you know much about our company, but that's a lot of what we work on are those, mm -hmm. you know, bringing, we do a lot of work around health and patient advocacy and, and all of this idea, the design thinking that goes into something and who needs to be in the beginning of the inception of a, of a problem solving. So love, love hearing that. I'm sure just yeah. thrilled. We'll be calling you to be, yeah. bring you on to some of our, our projects. Um, yeah. Thank you, Captain. This was great. Really appreciate you doing it. Let us you. Know, um, stay in touch, and uh, I really want to hear about your class that you're about to, the one that you were just talking about, and just love following your work, and thank you for staying the course when it's not so easy. I would imagine that what you're trying to do probably isn't so easy, and so uh, just, you know, we, we salute that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me on. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. She's pretty interesting. You're pretty 
great. I feel like she's um she's out there alone doing really really hard work. Yeah. To be a woman um in the field right now, that's still a tough. It's fairly male dominated, but she's raising really really difficult questions. So. Yeah, I agree. You guys, I want to stay in touch with her. Yeah. Um, I have, I'm going to leave you with one anecdote though. You know, when I worked as a young woman for Frank Oppenheimer at the Exploratorium, his brother Robert. Thud. Um, well, he said, whatever you do, this is when he was dying, he said, don't bring the computers into the Exploratorium because the complete artificial intelligence will be, that will be, will be on that path down. He did bring us the nuclear weapons, so I don't know if we should his be paid. His brother did, and that's why he knew. That's what he was saying. It's like he's been there and done that. It was okay. Kind of okay. Well, I'll see you on the next one. Bye.